time of year again of the resolution. You know, the last few months, we have feasted, have we not? I mean, we have feasted on turkey, we feasted on ham, we feasted on sweet potato and chocolate pie. I mean, we feasted, okay? We've done our fill. The last few months, we have exhausted our bank account. We have worn out our credit cards because we wanted to exchange gifts, because we wanted to go on these grand vacations, because we wanted to get those last-minute sales, did we not? And so here we are, January, January 12th, the first month of the new year, and what are we doing? Well, we're making resolutions that we're going to lose the weight that we gained over the last few months. We're making resolutions that we're going to build up our checking account and our savings account, that we're going to be better financially, that we're going to get rid of a lot of possessions in our house so that we can have a more streamlined life, right? We can have a, an easier going life and we'll have peace. That is until November when we start feasting and when we start spending money. I mean, it's just amazing that that is the circle of the American life. I mean, that's really how we live day by day. You know, around 244 years ago, we had our founding fathers write in a very important document, the Declaration of Independence, that our Creator had given us certain unalienable rights, certain rights that we could perceive in nature. And those rights include life, liberty, and what else? The pursuit of happiness. I mean, that's a noble cause. We, we, we desire the right to be happy. And we believe we have the right to pursue happiness. While that is a noble cause, I think that that understanding has been warped into the idea, the conviction that whatever I think is good for me is what is best. And whatever I think I want to do goes. I mean, a lot of our resolutions really are, if we're honest with ourselves, are self-centered. They're, they're self-based. I want to lose this amount of weight. I want to get into this form of fitness. I want to purchase that new thing. I want to have that new raise. I want to go travel to this exotic location. I, 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 me, 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 me. And, and I think that why we do that is because we want to be happy. We desire, we truly desire happiness. Well, Happiness, as we saw last Wednesday night, as we're going to see this morning, happiness is based on happenstance. But the, the anchor for the soul that will not fail us is joy. True joy will stand that test of time, just like those unbreakable promises given us by God. True joy is not based on circumstances. It is based on the ever-constant understanding of who you are in Christ Jesus. True joy will not fade. But sadly, so many of us are looking for happiness. We fail to find joy. See, because joy is not found in self. Joy is found in who Jesus is. If I desire to be happy, I need to live for Jesus. I need to live in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, and for Jesus Christ. I want you to think about what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, the life that I live on this earth, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I need to ask you this, this question this morning. Why were you saved? I want us to think about that for a minute because while God's salvation is so simple, God has made it so simple for us to be saved, it has rather been muddied by humanity. Uh, we, we, have, we have misunderstood what salvation means. Here's another word we may not use as often, what conversion means. The idea of conversion is going from one place to another place. It's an understanding of change. Why was I saved? Why was I converted? See, we are saved, again, in Christ. We're converted to Christ Jesus. And so I want us to do something this morning. First, I want us to look at some of the misunderstandings regarding salvation, regarding conversion. And then I want us to properly define what it means to be saved and what it means to live for Christ. And so we're going to look at that this morning, and I pray that at the end of this lesson, each of us can say we have joy as the anchor. And we talk about hope being the anchor of the soul. Well, joy is also an anchor for the soul. So if you have your Bibles, let's look together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We, we first want to begin with verse 2. Then we're going to drop down to verse 10 and read through verse 11. 
to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together, with all those who are in every place, call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both to their Lord and ours. Drop down with me in verse 9. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there, are, there is quarreling among you, my brothers. Now, this may come to a shock, so, so don't be ready to throw stones at me just yet, okay? But we need to look at some misunderstandings regarding salvation. First of all, we are not saved Hear me on this. We're not saved. We're not converted to a church. We're not converted to a church. Here's what I mean by that. I had a friend in college. She was religious, and we were talking about religion one day, and I brought up the discussion of baptism. I asked her what she thought about baptism. She said, well, I don't know much about it, but I have been baptized three times. I looked at her and said, three times? Is everything okay? And she said, well, you know, I had friends, and they went to this church, and they told me in order to become a part of that church, to be members of that church, I'd be baptized there. And then, then I, I decided not to go to that church anymore. I went over to this church over here. And they said, oh, you're baptized at that church? Well, you need to be rebaptized to join our church. And so I was baptized over there. Then the third church, and this is the church where she was currently placing her membership, they said, oh, no, either of those, th- those, aren't, those aren't a part of our membership. So in order to be a part of our church, you had to be baptized in our church. And I just looked at her and said, what are you talking about? Hey, you know, we, we talk about our church. Our church does this. Our church does that. Our church over here goes there. Our church isn't a part of that over there. I, I want to make something clear. There's only one church. There's only one body in Christ Jesus. I know that can be offensive. I know that that can be offensive, but we're going to read in just a little bit how the message of the cross can be offensive to people. We need to make sure, not whether or not people are enjoying our church, but whether part we, are, we are a part of the church. I need to make sure if I'm part of the church, if you look with me in verse 2, Paul said, to the church of God. That is in Corinth. See, yes, there are many congregations, many places of gathering, but there's only one church. Paul said this church has a lot of people who are being sanctified in it, who are set apart to be saints together. Did you notice in verse 9? God is faithful. You can trust God. Isn't that wonderful? God is faithful. He will sustain you to the end, we read in verse 8. But God is faithful by whom you were called into one of many fellowships. Called into the fellowship. I'll see if you're reading along with me. Verse 9. God is faithful. He's the one who called you. Listen to that. He's the one who called you. And you are now a part of the fellowship. The fellowship is found where? Found in Christ Jesus. So when I say this morning, we're not being converted to a church, what I'm saying is that we're being converted for Christ. We're being converted to Christ. And once we are saved, we can look in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Here is the consequence, one of the many wonderful blessings of being part added to the body of Christ, is that the Lord adds to their number daily. The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. We make going to heaven much harder than God ever intended. And sometimes we make it more difficult to join our church than it is to go to heaven. See, understand, God is the one who adds you to the church. But you're converted to Christ. Once you're converted to Christ, once you're saved in the name of Jesus Christ, then He adds you to the church. Paul said, we're to be of one mind. We're to be of one judgment. We're to be united together. Why having all this quarreling? Why is there all this division? Well, we would learn why shortly after, beginning in verse 12. And this is the second thing we need to understand. Salvation is not being converted to a preacher. It's not being converted to a preacher. Verse 12. What I mean is, okay, see, this is what's wonderful about Paul. He says, I heard there's some quarreling. Here's what I mean. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul. Or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? 
Sometimes, sometimes we might place our allegiance in a preacher rather than the person of Jesus. That is a shame. And that's coming from a preacher. I want you to hear me on this. See, there's division in Corinth. There, there are a lot of reasons. You read the first ten chapters or so, you'll be swarmed, saturated with issues in Corinth. But it began with the division. Some were allegiant to Paul. Some relied on Paul. Why? Well, Paul was the first one who preached the gospel in Corinth. He's the one that brought the truth to Corinth. And so some people had their loyalty put in the person who first converted him. Well, after Paul left, you know who came in? Apollos. And people liked Apollos, not just because he had the knowledge of the truth, but he was very eloquent. He was one of those powerful preachers, and a lot of people enjoy the powerful, dynamic preachers. Well, some still, they, they had their allegiance in Cephas, Cephas being Peter. Well, why, why wouldn't you want to follow Peter? I mean, he's the stuff of legend, even among the apostles. I mean, this guy preached one sermon. He didn't even get to the invitation song, and 3,000 souls were saying, okay, I want to be baptized into Christ. I mean, you talk about a guy, you talk about a guy who's famous. That was Peter. Still, some were saying that they were a, a lot, they were, they were loyal to Christ, but even they used the name of Jesus to be superior to the other brothers. It's easy for us to find that preacher of choice. And it doesn't have to be a preacher. It can be any kind of motivational speaker. It can be a spiritual leader, someone who's influential, someone who's like a mentor to us. But see, the moment that we put them on the pedestal, we're taking God off of His throne. So here's what we need to understand is it is tempting for us to be loyal to a person rather than loyal to Jesus. It's easy for us to be loyal to that person who brought us first to Christ. And we're going to listen to them more than anyone else. It may be that person who's very influential, very dynamic. I mean, they really get you excited for Jesus. And you want to follow that person. Still, it might be that person who's so famous. I mean, you hear about them all throughout the country. Every place they go, churches are being built and souls are being saved. And you say, I, I want to hear that person speak. Let me tell you something. People, they disappoint you, including preachers. See, people, they stumble. They're imperfect. I need Jesus just as much as you need Jesus. Furthermore, were you... Were you saved by my name? No, you weren't. I did not die on the cross for you. I could not have died on the cross for you because I myself am a sinner. See, it is Jesus and in His power alone that we're saved. Is Christ divided? I think that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Is Christ divided? Were you saved in the name of Paul? Was it Paul who brought you deliverance through the grace of God by the gospel of Paul? No. It's through Jesus, Him alone, that we're saved. Preachers, spiritual leaders, mentors, motivational speakers, they sin, they struggle, they stumble, and they need God just as much as you do. That's a condition that people in preaching circles call preacheritis. It's a, it's a severe illness where people rather listen to humans rather than listen to the Word of God. Third, Salvation is not being converted to a convenient religion. Sometimes people become Christians because they like the atmosphere of someone's worship. They enjoy the friendliness of certain people. Maybe it's because the church offers coffee, offer breakfast, lunch, free babysitting. I mean, there are a lot of different avenues and ways we can serve one another. And let me tell you, it is a blessing that we can serve each other. It is a blessing that we're able to help clothe those who are without clothing. It's a blessing that we're able to help feed those who are without food. But I have to tell you something. Christianity is not a convenient religion. Christianity is not a matter of convenience. It is a lifelong devotion to the God of the universe, to the ever-sacrificing Messiah, Jesus the Christ, for the ever-empowering Holy Spirit, Christianity has to be a lifelong pursuit. I want you to remember some things that Paul wrote. And before we look at what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1, I want to remind you of something Jesus himself said. This is something I love about Jesus. And the things that he said on this earth, he never hid the truth from me. He was always so honest. 
Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross some of the time. Once in a while. Sunday morning, 9.30 to 11.45. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Does that sound convenient to you? I'm sorry, Jesus. I'm sorry, Jesus. I like the sound of that, but I'm a little busy today. We have to deny ourselves. Take up our cross daily. That, that cross refers to shame, humiliation, rejection, and persecution for the name of Christ Jesus. We have to daily walk in the holy footsteps that Jesus once walked while he was on this earth. He set the example. There's no deceit found in his mouth. There's no sin found wherever he went. He was perfect. And I have to follow him. Even when it's inconvenient. Even when we have to change our busy schedules. Here's the thing about Paul. Paul is the author of 1 Corinthians. Well, really, it's the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit worked through Paul. Paul, in another letter in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, he said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. See, for Paul, Jesus wasn't about convenience. Jesus was the goal of his life. He says, as long as I'm on this earth, my pursuit is Jesus himself. And when I die, I'm really gaining everything. I'm really benefiting everything, things that you could not comprehend. Everlasting life. And I have joy in his name. See, true salvation, true conversion, it's not a matter of being converted to a church being converted to a preacher, being converted to something that is convenient, but being converted to Jesus, to His Lordship, to His walk, to His life, His suffering, His death, and oh yes, His resurrection. That is something that Paul was conveying to Corinth. And he said, let me tell you what it means. Let me tell you what it means to be a Christian. So let's look at that together as we continue on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's define Christ-centered conversion, what it means to live for Jesus. We continue reading. I thank God, verse 14, that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel." Not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be empty of its power. Paul was thankful that he hadn't baptized many people. Why is that? Well, you know, when you read verse 17, some people conclude that baptism doesn't really matter. Why? Well, Paul said, I wasn't sent to baptize, I was sent to preach. We need to understand what Paul is conveying in the first letter to the Corinthians. See, Paul understood the, the power of of baptism. He understood how essential baptism was. I mean, you could go to Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And Ananias told Paul, before he became a Christian, he said, why are you waiting? What are you waiting for? Arise, be baptized, and wash your sins away. This is how he called the name of the Lord. He said, I understand what it means to be baptized. I know it washes away sin. Later, Romans chapter 6, Paul talked about how we are dead in trespasses and our old selves are, are holding us down in the bondage of sin. But when we're baptized, we bury our old selves. We're buried into Christ Jesus and we're raised up to walk newness of life. Paul understood the importance of baptism. So why did Paul say, I'm glad I didn't baptize a lot of you? Paul didn't want the glory of baptizing anyone. See, Paul's concern in Corinth was, well, whoever baptized me, whoever baptized me is my leader. And I'm going to praise him because I was baptized by his hands. See, Paul, Paul knew the power of the gospel and he did not want the power diminished. Notice verse 17. I did not want the power diminished. The cross of Christ be emptied of its power due to self-pride or glory. 
That's what Paul is bringing about in verse 15. I don't want anyone to say that they're baptized in my name because they're baptized for Christ, not for Paul. See, what it means to be a Christ-centered, converted person, what it means to experience Christ-centered conversion is, first of all, I'm honoring God every day. Every single thing I do, every single thing I say, I'm honoring God. Paul wrote in Colossians 3, verse 17, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. What that means is that everything I do is by the authority of Christ. That everything I do is pleasing to Christ Jesus. That no matter how I walk, it is something that God would be proud of. Something that God would approve. Paul said, what it means to live for Jesus, to be saved to Jesus, it means I'm going to honor Him every single day. No matter what I speak, no matter where I go, no matter what actions I take, every single day, I'm going to give thanks to God. My body's going to be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, pleasing to God. Every day I want to glorify God. Second, what it means to be converted to Christ is that I share God. Every day. You continue on verse 18. Verses 18 through 25. For the word of cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us, to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will throw up. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God more powerful than men. To live a holy life. Yes, it means to follow Jesus. But that's not the end to our Christian walk. We're called to proclaim the ever-changing, ever-powerful words of Jesus. When I say ever-changing, I don't mean that God's Word changes, but that it changes me. And I understand that to some, Jesus' words will be foolish. I understand to some... The Word of God will not be enough. I understand to some, I'm actually bringing about hurt in my life because I proclaim Christ. But it does not matter. Why? Because I know in Christ there is power that makes a difference. I know in Christ on the cross there is power to change my life. Yes, some will consider me foolish. Some will consider me Some will consider me to be worthless, while some will still demand more. But God is wiser. God is stronger. And God still reigns supreme. And so every day, I'm going to carry the good news in my heart and on my lips because I've been saved. I'm saved to Christ. Thirdly and finally, what it means to be converted to Christ, what it means to live daily for Christ is that I trust God Every day. I trust Him every day. Drop down with me to verse 30. And because of Him, because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that as is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Living for Jesus is difficult. In fact, living for Jesus may mean that you have to sacrifice your own life for His cause, for His purpose. It's going to lead to persecution, rejection, and pain. All the same, we know in the end, the the blessing belongs to those in Jesus. Paul wrote, as he concluded this chapter, that we who are in Christ have experienced righteousness. That means to be in a right standing place before God. You don't have to worry about any shame. You don't have to worry about any embarrassment when you stand before God because you're righteous in Christ Jesus. It also means, we continue on looking, we are also sanctified. That refers to being pure. There are no blemishes. There's no stain. You're perfect in Christ Jesus. And then, of course, 
this precious word be redeemed. Sweet is the song I'm singing today. I'm redeemed. That word redemption means be bought back. It's not something I've earned. It's not something that should belong to me. It's something that He paid the price for and then gave to me. I've been redeemed. See, I was in a position. I was in a state of sin. I was under bondage to sin. And my only outcome was death. But thanks be to God that Jesus came to set me free. I want you to understand something this morning, church. You're not set free because of any congregation. You're not set free because of any preacher. You're not set free because of any convenience found in Christianity. You're set free because of Jesus Christ. And only through Jesus will you find joy. You'll find satisfaction that will never diminish will never fade, and will never disappoint. So in 2020, as we look at our resolutions and look at how we're going to change our lives and change the world, I want to ask you something. Do you want true joy? Happiness is built on happenstance, but the anchor for the soul is joy. That joy can only be found in Christ Jesus. can't be found in Jason Campbell. can't be found in the eldership in Christ alone. Don't you want that joy? If you're not a child of God, understand that although you are a sinner, Christ came for you. He came to redeem you, to sanctify you, and make you righteous in the eyes of God. Be baptized, not in the name of Jason, but in the name of Jesus. Have your sins washed away as Paul did and call on the name of the Lord. If you are a child of God, and perhaps there is division in your household, there's division in your life, there's quarreling between you and another person, Why not let it be known? Why not ask for forgiveness? Because the same God who delivered you is the same God who will continue to sanctify you, continue to cleanse you, continue to hold you firm and fast until the end. Why not make it known and have peace with Him? If you need anything at all, come now while we stand, while we sing.